Welcome to the podcast recording of Middle East AI News, live for Thursday, September 19th, 2024, brought to you by On Demand, turbocharged AI product development and integration. You're listening to Carrington Malin's discussion with Osama El Masri, the Middle East lead for data responsibility and privacy at technology services and consulting company Cognizant. We talk about Saudi Arabia's personal data protection law, and the beginning of the enforcement phase of the regulation. Let's dive into today's topic. In today's Thursday deep dive, we're going to be talking about Saudi Arabia's personal data protection law, or PDPL, and the end of a 12-month grace period given to organizations to comply with the new law, which ended last Saturday, September 14th. In today's show, we're going to touch on what the Saudi personal data protection law contains, what the end of the 12-month transition period means, other recent data, guidelines, and regulations related to the PDPL, uh, what the top priorities should be for those affected by the law, and what we can expect moving forwards. And I'm going to be joined by Osama Al Masri, the Middle East lead for data responsibility and privacy at Cognizant. Osama Al Masri is the Middle East lead for data responsibility and privacy at global technology and services and consulting company Cognizant. He works with large organizations in Saudi Arabia and across the Middle East to design and implement privacy and data protection compliance programs according to Saudi PDPL and other data protection laws in other countries such as Egypt and the UAE and also Europe's famous GDPR. Osama is also KnowledgeNet Chapter Chair Saudi Arabia for the International Association of Privacy Professionals, the largest privacy association in the world, which facilitates discussion among industry leaders and provides resources for data privacy practitioners. Before moving to Saudi Arabia, he was data protection and privacy officer for Vodafone Egypt, the largest mobile network operator in Egypt. So a warm welcome to Middle East AI News Live, Osama Al Masri. Thanks, Carton, for the introduction and for hosting me today. Thanks very much for making the time to join us. I'm looking forward to getting an update on this because the last time I talked about this was probably in March or April on on a show like this. And uh, we've moved on from that. And there's been some activity. And we're also past the transition deadline. Perhaps we could start with just uh, a little brief about what Cognizant is and does. Yeah, so Cognizant is mainly um, like global system integrator. Uh, We have over uh, 330,000 employees with uh, $20 billion uh, in revenue. Uh, We specialize mainly in uh, digital transformation across 20 sectors, uh, including uh, like improving and enhancing privacy and security across uh, those um, like uh, sectors within uh, embedded within the digital transformation programs, uh, including banking, healthcare, and telecom. Also, we leverage technologies like uh, IoT, AI, and cloud to deliver tailored solutions for our clients and also investing in an upskilling uh, initiative to prepare over a million individuals for digital future by 2026. Wow, impressive. And uh, where is Cognizant in the region? You're based in Riyadh? I'm based in uh, Dubai. Currently, we, are, we exist in the Middle East uh, since 2008. We have offices in uh, UAE, Abu Dhabi, Dubai, and also in Saudi Arabia and Riyadh, Qatar as well. Here in the Middle East, we are having or driving a very impactful uh, transformation in sectors like banking, healthcare, and aviation and telecoms. Our commitment to digital transformation is mainly leveraging, as I said, like AI technologies to enhance uh, the daily lives of um, individuals and improve the healthcare outcomes within uh, the Middle East, also strengthening the privacy and security uh, compliance through implementing um, like uh, dedicated compliance programs according to the laws and regulations in the respective countries and elevating the travel experience across uh, the whole region as well as part of our work in the aviation sector. What does your role entail day to day and how do you help organizations? We have different clients across different sectors in the region where we tailor for them like a dedicated comprehensive compliance program designed for their privacy domains. This is one of the important things that program or compliance programs has to be tailored into the DNA or also embedded within the business operating model and the business nature, the processes within the organizations. So this is one of the key factors. You cannot, there is no one size fits all. So that's why we ensure a very a high quality, consistent deliverables across like the different clients we are assisting or supporting with their compliance programs. Also establishing long-term strategic partnerships. We are known as well with uh, being 
with the clients for years. So we stick with our clients, especially with the ongoing. Of course, compliance is a journey. So it's not like a one year thing. So we live this journey with our clients and bring them into a very uh, good state when it comes to complying with the privacy laws and regulations. And finally, my role also entails the business development of the privacy compliance uh, and the data responsibility and privacy within the Middle East. And most importantly, building the delivery community for that. Of course, you know that uh, there is a scarcity when it comes to privacy calibers in the region. So this is what we are investing in right now to ensure that we are having a knowledge transfer to the new joiners, especially in Saudi. We have a dedicated focus there for Saudi nationals as well. So increase the supply against the high demand that we are seeing from our clients. Excellent. Let's uh, start a discussion on PDPL with a little bit of background uh, before we talk about the recent developments. And why does Saudi Arabia need a PDPL and who does it serve? As you can tell, actually, it's in line with the, the KSA Vision 2030. So as the vision states that it's all about diversifying the economy, empowering citizens and enhancing the global standing. PDPL is one of the major steps that the kingdom has taken in order to have a robust and balanced personal data protection law that is coping. And we can say that it's in line with the international data protection legislation, similar to EU GDPR, China uh, PIP, the California Consumer Protection Act, and so on. So it started as with EU GDPR and then other jurisdictions, other countries have started to follow. I can claim that kingdom is leading in this space when it comes to the, the, the KSA PDPL. And also this helps a lot to with the boosting the economy and the diversification in the kingdom with the digital transformation and the different industries that the kingdom is uh, giving a high focus now compared to the oil and gas previously. So now they are diversifying their economy and this will help a lot with boosting such industries. Yes, it has become a good law. And I think it's easy to get sidetracked with the fact that the law was originally intended to be introduced in 2022, and now it's becoming fully enforceable in September 2024. But actually, this is a fairly normal process. And GDPR had several delays before that was implemented, mainly for the benefit of those that the law affected. And I think so, Sidae Audit it deserves credit there for holding those public consultations and getting that feedback from the business community and the legal community. Correct. And this is one of the unique things that the kingdom is giving a very big attention towards not just adopting GDPR or any other principles or the main mandates, but rather ensuring that they are somehow modifying or customizing the law to ensure that they mitigate the challenges that was faced by like uh, the countries in Europe uh, as, as a result of the GDPR, also a bit of a localization uh, to ensure the embedding of the kingdom's culture and uh, like uh, Middle Eastern uh, traditions and habits within the law as well. And we will touch upon this as we go with the show, inshallah. Yeah, absolutely. So from a consumer point of view, how does this help me as a, as a consumer in Saudi Arabia to have this law in place? Similar to any, data, any other data protection legislation, um, the whole idea behind those kind of laws and regulations is giving control to the data subject. When we say data subject, we refer to where the personal data is being processed. So mainly we are giving control to them over their personal data. And this, it goes from the simple data subject rights, as we may call it, as privacy professionals, in terms of right to be informed. There has to be a transparency about how the organizations are processing your data. And this is mainly represented in the privacy notices that are being published by the different organizations uh, to let you know what is being uh, done with your data, how they collect it, how they protect it, how, for how long they store it, and so on. And in addition to that, the other rights, the, the right to access and the right to get a copy of your data, to rectify it or update it as needed, and even request its deletion with certain regulations and, uh, of course, um, like uh, limits uh, as stated by the law. So this is one of the big objectives and benefits that the consumers will get. Also, in terms of uh, breach uh, notifications, previously, it's, it's not like well, it was a mandate to notify, notifying the regulator is something that is well known for decades. But however, uh, here we are talking about notifying the data subject when there is a potential or an actual impact to the person. In addition to the consent where you need to opt in for certain things that you didn't opt in for or when collecting the personal data from you, you were not agreeing on certain things. So if there is a new purpose that uh, according to the law full under the consent basis, they give you the opportunity to opt in and out with transparency and the consent as it's known in the 
privacy industry. So those are too many things. And one final thing that I might highlight is the proactive privacy risk management on the organization, where it's not only about you as a consumer benefiting or directly benefiting from this, it's about the proactive measures that the organization has to put in place in order to ensure that there is a privacy by design, there is a privacy impact assessment before launching new products or services. So this means that it's more of ensuring that there, is, there will be no privacy violation uh, before the product launch gets launched. And this is one of the unique things about the law and regulation of privacy. So it, for people who are not in the industry, the, the, the regulations um, like actually uh, measures and monitors the proactive uh, processes and operations within the organization. And organizations can easily get fined for not following a proactive measure. So this is the unique thing about the data protection legislation that this does not wait till the, there is an incident or a violation, and then they give you a fine. They even monitor how you proactively uh, design your privacy products, how you embed the privacy and security measures in, within your products and services before launching them. So all benefiting the consumer on all aspects. Yes, and I think being clear about intent when collecting data is now made even more important with the use of artificial intelligence and the, the new generation of artificial intelligence apps that learn everything about you. And so we need to be clear about what they're actually learning. Yes, exactly. And this is one of the common principles between privacy and AI governance that we will touch upon later as well. In terms of the type of organization, what organizations does this apply to? Does it apply equally to government and private organizations in the kingdom or also those outside? It equally applies on any organization, whether private or public, as long as they process personal data. And here there is a resemblance with the GDPR when it comes to the coverage, like uh, the extraterritorial scope, where there is an extra geographical coverage of the law. So it does not only apply on the organizations within the kingdom that process personal data, but extends to organizations that process personal data of people within the kingdom or residing in the kingdom by any means. So this is one of the things, in addition to something that was not in GDPR, which is the protection or the processing of deceased individuals as well. So this is something new here. That's why I was talking about not copying or adopting the GDPR as is, but ensuring that it has been localized to meet the expectations of the citizens within the kingdom and the residents within the kingdom, and also mitigates some of the challenges that were faced after GDPR. So how does it apply to the deceased? Yeah, so this is the individual, mainly it, tackle, it mainly focus on anything when you process uh, the data in order to, like for any processing, like if it's a public organization that part of their processing requires to keep data of deceased individuals. So any data may lead to identifying that deceased person or a member of their family. So this would be considered as covered by the law. So this is one of the very important things that was also included here um, in Saudi, we care about like uh, the ethnic group and certain things that is of a very important focus here in the kingdom. And this is why it was included clearly within the law that it's part of the, the coverage or the material scope, if we may call it, of the law. You mentioned the deceased privacy data as one of the differences with GDPR. Are there any other distinct differences between the Saudi PDPL and GDPR that you could point out? Yeah, so one of the things that was added as well is the legal guardian mandates, which is something uh, usually like in, in GDPR, there is a, the articles talking about processing the children's data. However, there is a dedicated article, which is Article 13 in the implementing regulations about the legal guardian and how they should have an authority to, to exercise the minors. They are not calling, they are not focusing on children only. In the PDPL, they are talking about individuals who lack partially or fully legal capacity and minors are part of that. So it's not only focusing on children and this is more broader within the PDPL. And it talks about the authority that is being given to a legal guardian over the individuals that are lacking uh, fully or uh, partially the legal capacity. And this includes minors and how the law regulates this in terms of giving the authority and ensuring that the organizations are putting the measures to give the control back to those minors when they reach the adult age. So what this is one of the things. The other difference, major difference, is in the cross-border transfer regulations, where in GDPR uh, there are three clear the transfer mechanisms, which is the adequacy decision countries list, followed by the appropriate safeguards as, a second, as an alternative, and followed by derogations or exceptions as a third uh, alternative mechanism. When it comes to PDPL, 
Now we are limited with the adequacy decision countries list that we are all waiting to be published by Sadaya. And then the next mechanism, uh, only one alternative mechanism, which is appropriate safeguards. And this one has been limited by certain use cases and there is no exception. So this is one of the customization. And I believe this is meant like this is not just done like that. It's meant to be done this way in order to support the vision 2030 and to limit certain cases of uh, transferring outside in order to boost the economy by encouraging data centers providers to uh, build their data centers within the kingdom. And so why, in your opinion, do you think the 12-month transition period was built in? And what did the authorities expect to happen during that 12-month transition period? So the, maybe the 12 month period or 18 months as it was in GDPR, this is the period that we call it the grace period. So once the law and the regulations are out and released, then what follows next is giving a grace period to organizations to comply with those requirements. And then after that date of the, after this transition or grace period ends, the authority can start auditing and conducting their visits to the different organizations. And here we have even a don't rate privilege given to us to the supervisory authority personnel in order to conduct this kind of audits. And they can start issuing fines and applying penalties according to any detected violations. We're at the end of that transition period and they are able to te- carry out enforcement activities. You mentioned raids, but does that include any automatic checks? Does it include any other sort of engagement with organizations in the kingdom to uh, make sure they're compliant? Yes, so they have the privilege. When we say don't rate privilege, it means that um, they have the power to go directly without uh, any prior notification to organizations and they can seize any equipment in order to, as collecting it as an evidence. And this usually used in rape cases in case there is an incident, a big incident, uh, where the organization might be hiding or not complying with the law by notifying the regulator or in certain investigations. So this is one of the powers uh, that is given to the supervisory authority as well. And all is aiming to ensure that uh, there is a proper implementation uh, meant to monitor and establish uh, a robust law. In the the meantime, it's a balanced law that uh, actually Um, gives focus to the business objectives as well. So it's it's not just like any law where it's being forced without the consideration of the business objectives and the revenues aspiration by different organizations. Do we have any information or any knowledge on what the expected penalties might be for organizations that are not compliant or that perhaps are deliberately not compliant? Yeah. So mainly we are talking about individual like fines that may like vary from uh, starting the 3 million reals up to 5 million reals. And uh, there is a possibility of uh, two years imprisonment for any individual who unlawfully process the personal data. Also, in addition to that, that a supervisory authority may enforce the organization to uh, publish their like uh, the fine in, in public news as well. Yep. This is already covered as part of the law articles. One of the unique things that was introduced in the PDPL is a big difference when it comes to the cross-border transfer compared to GDPR. So you can say that the regulations right now is trying to introduce a balance between data residency and allowance for data to be transferred, personal data to be transferred outside. One of the things that is being introduced as like an extra uh, filter or extra check before deciding whether you are allowed to transfer the personal data outside the kingdom or not is introducing certain allowed scenarios, if we may call it similar to the lawful basis. So the lawful basis in GDPR is fixed, six lawful basis, and this is done as part of your privacy impact assessment to identify the lawfulness of the processing. However, there is an extra check that you need to do to decide whether you are allowed to transfer the data. One of the things that in case that there is a contractual or um, agreement where the data subject is part of it. So this is one of the scenarios. Another scenario is Uh, If you are conducting, if you are a group of companies and you are having centralized operations and you need to have this centralized operations to process to one of your subsidiaries, which is uh, happen to be outside the kingdom. Also, one of the things that is allowed is for scientific research as well. So there are certain cases where you are allowed. And if you noticed one of the cases that is not allowed right now under the transfer, as per the allowed scenarios, is if you think about the hosting, like the infrastructure, cloud hosting or cloud service as infrastructure as a service, this is, you cannot find a lawful basis for that or an allowed scenario for that according to the law, because it's not one of the, the limited, the, 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 this kind of legitimate interest, if we may call it 
processing to the centralized operations in one scenario. In other scenario, if you are providing a benefit or a service to the data subject, which is not the case when it comes to cloud hosting, where mainly the benefit is uh, on the organization side. When it comes to after that, so that's an additional check that is being introduced by PDPL. Uh, next to that, you would go into the next filter, which is deciding whether your destination country is one of the adequacy countries list that we are uh, awaiting uh, to be published by the regulator. And if it's one of those, then you may transfer unless there is an ongoing or large uh, scale of uh, processing of sensitive data. At this point, it's not restricted. However, uh, you would be able to conduct a transfer impact assessment. However, when it comes to PDPL, in addition to the scenarios that are being limited at the beginning, when it comes to appropriate safeguards, you are only allowed to use those mechanisms with the specific scenarios, one of which like if it's a limited or non-repetitive transfer, which used to be a derogation or an exception under GDPR. So now it became a limitation on the appropriate safeguard. So as you can see, there is no total prohibition or keeping or maintaining the data residency. There is an allowance for the transfer. However, it's balanced to meet the objective of the, the kingdom and to ensure that they are keeping what is needed as a benefit out of the data resident, residency without, this is what I meant by a robust and balanced law, without impacting the business objectives of the organizations. The, this personal data transfer was regulations were just updated during the last few weeks, weren't they? Yeah, that's correct, yeah. And what impact do you think those regulations have on cloud services in Saudi Arabia? Because we've had some new cloud services introduced with local regions from uh, big cloud service providers and more promised in the short term. Is that, is that increased the pressure on services and uh, IT organizations to have local cloud? Yes. Uh, so now we are talking, if we are talking specifically about infrastructure as a service, now they are being pushed, those data center or uh, infrastructure as a service providers are uh, pressured to, as soon as possible, operate their data centers within the kingdom. Because as I mentioned, one of the restricted scenarios right now is hosting or transferring the data outside for the infrastructure as a service, as a use case. So this is where the pressure will be on data centers, providers like Amazon, Google, Microsoft to open their data centers as soon as possible in the kingdom had some new regulations coming in or updated regulations coming in the last few weeks. There's also been in the last few months some education and awareness campaigns that have been started by SIDEA. There's been some so government to business campaigns, there's been some public awareness campaigns. In July, they had a social media campaign, mainly understanding the meaning of your data. Do you see that the level of awareness has gone up in, in the kingdom as a result? And has that affected the, the conversations you've had with organizations in the kingdom? Definitely. By far, this uh, has been very well noticed uh, that the awareness is there. Even if you noticed, like similar to GDPR, prior to the enforcement date, there was the panic mode for certain organizations where they decided to publish their privacy notices and uh, do certain actions that are customer facing. And just to, as a proof of the, the increase of the awareness, as a response from the data subjects or the citizens, when they saw something that is not compliant with the law, and it's not because that they are aware of the law as much as it respects the privacy of the individuals. So when they felt that there is something that invading their privacy or not in line, so immediately they reported to their respective regulators and there has been complaints uh, as a result of this. The adjustment period and testing waters period that follows the enforcement date will be shorter compared to GDPR. We've had a number of announcements from Sadea in the past few weeks. They include rules for appointing personal data protection officer. And as I mentioned, the updated regulation on personal data transferred outside the kingdom. And I guess we can expect these updates to continue into the, this next year as well. Yeah, definitely. My expectation is... Also, when certain visits and audits are conducted to organizations by the by SADIA or the supervisory authority, the reason I'm saying SADIA could be other supervisory authority because there is, as per the law, it can be done by sectorial uh, regulator like SAMA, for example, for financial uh, sector. So as a result of those audits and the findings, I expect to be more tailored awareness that will be 
published. So in case that there is a plan for certain things that are standard guidance that will be issued similar to the ones that we have seen uh, the past uh, few weeks, I assume that there will be tailored uh, guidance that will be issued in, as a result of the findings as well to increase the awareness or highlight the, 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 the pitfalls uh, by the organizations when it comes to their implementation of their privacy compliance program. This is quite a far-reaching set of issues for a big organization to deal with. And it's not a question of putting a, a tick box on a website page where you're collecting somebody's sign-up data. There's actually a lot, of, a lot of angles that need to be considered. There's also an ongoing process of uh, updating regulations surrounding this law. And so the whole thing needs to be looked at as a program rather than uh, as a project that's going to end you know, in a couple of weeks or a month or three months. Yes, um, like a very good spot on, uh, Farrington. Um, this is one of the things that needs to be really like a common understanding amongst the organization that it's uh, uh, the compliance with privacy is or the, the lo- privacy laws and regulations is a journey and it's an ongoing thing. So you cannot really claim. That's why when we held our chapter event, we meant to give the title of are you 100% compliant because you can never reach 100%. Compared to if you look at GDPR organizations after six years now, you cannot easily claim 100% compliance. It's a journey. You need to always adjust because your business is evolving and you are introducing new products and services as you go. And uh, on top of that, the AI products. So definitely you need to cope and you will face certain uh, mistakes as you do uh, try to comply with the law and then you would rectify them. You may need to introduce a new process, a new governing process, uh, add something to your policy in order to keep it live. So it's a journey. It cannot be a tick in the box. And this is, I would like to use this chance as well that this kind of approach is more of underestimating the, definitely, we have to admit that not all countries are equal when it comes to regulations and the enforcement by the supervisory authority. But when it comes to the kingdom, it's like it's a false or it's not right estimation to to think that uh, like the regulator would be like uh, incompetent, for example, or not able to find certain things or it will be easy when it comes to applying uh, the, 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 the penalties. And this is due to the very simple fact of the, the lengthy, as you were you were highlighting like a few minutes ago. The lengthy process of issuing the law, the, like uh, the amendments that happened, the delay that happened, all of this shows us that there is a very good will from the or very persistent will from the regulator to ensure that there is a balanced and robust uh, like uh, laws and regulations. I've seen other countries where they are just adopting the GDPR without um, any kind of um, like giving uh, um, a thorough thinking how to localize it or how to support the local business or the uh, the national objectives of the country. So that lengthy process gives me the indication that they will be serious about applying this. So the tick in the box shouldn't be the approach. And we will come towards, like we will come across this like a few minutes in later about what to do in terms of if you are an organization, whether you already started your journey or you still didn't start it. So we will give an advice about this as well. But a good spot on uh, Carrington on this. Let's tackle that now because it can seem a bit daunting when you see these all these different regulations announced and you see this delay because of public consultation, obviously more work's got into it. And I think, as I said before, Sidea deserves credit for doing the work. From an organization's point of view, how do I make sense of this? How do I look at this whole privacy and data protection compliance area and start working on it? So uh, simply what you need to, like, uh, if we segment them, let's segment the organizations now with people who were in advance of the law and they started their journey earlier and uh, organization that still didn't start their uh, journey. So for anyone who started their journey and they are at a good uh, progress uh, state now with their compliance program, um, mainly what they need to do is to continue their implementation, uh, have a clear progress about uh, the, the like uh, what they have achieved, what is remaining, and this should be visible to their internal and external auditors, including the supervisory authority. And also proactively seek consultation. One of the very important factors when it comes to the enforcement of the regulator and one of the things that drive the regulator sometimes to issue fines and to be hard on organization is seeing two main attitudes. If you are underestimating the law or the mandates or the the power of the supervisory authority, or if we are trying to mislead them, so like lack of transparency or hide things. Those are, I would consider, those are the two provo- provocative approaches that the organization may adopt 
uh, as we as they deal with the regulator. And this is what we advise organizations to totally avoid uh, while implementing this program. So if you are in an advanced state, seek consultation. This will build credibility with your reg respective regulator, including Sadia, if they, if they are the ones who will be conducting the audits. And this will show how seriously you are tackling the matter and even asking for certain things that might seem ambiguous to you when it comes to the implementation. And this differs from one sector or one industry to another. If we talk about organizations that still didn't start their like uh, their program and still have a lot to do, so uh, my advice would be start by registering on the national governance platform, national data governance platform that was published by or announced by Sadaya. So in order to become like uh, a data controller, so you have to register it. Uh, Hire a DPO. This is one of the very important things, and it's taking a long time within organizations in order to settle, considering the power of the DPO. If you look at the tasks and the authority the DPO is having, he's more of an inter internal auditor or the eye of the regulator within the organization. And this is one of the things that is delaying the appointment of the DPOs within the organization. So another thing is to speed up this process, hire a DPO, uh, have a good uh, program design that is tailored to your uh, business model and operations and uh, your products and services portfolio and a clear roadmap with clear timelines and communicate transparently with the regulator now before starting the implementation because now we are talking about the, enfor the enforcement the, the transition period has ended so you need to communicate transparently with the regulator now or sadaya uh, as applicable with what you have done and the design terms of the design and the roadmap and by when you will be compliant or achieve certain mandates and seek extension if needed. So extension is one of the things of the grace period, one of the things that is allowed by PDPL. Uh, however, it will be in the discretion, according to the discretion of the regulator. So this is one of the things that they may uh, also seek uh, in order to uh, get, gain more time in order to achieve compliance. This has obviously got some gray areas in it. Uh, can we say that if you are engaging ongoing with the regulator and you're showing that you're making progress and putting in measures, you're likely to be viewed in a more favorable light than those that are not taking any action and are not engaging? Exactly. The role of DPO. Sadeo recently published guidelines for appointing DPOs, which I believe were for government departments. What should organizations consider and does the DPO need to be a Saudi citizen? There is no mandate for the DPO to be a Saudi citizen. This is as per the DPO appointment rules. They even allow for external DPO to be appointed. They allow for multiple DPOs to be appointed. So there is a flexibility towards this. The main focus from the regulator when it comes to the appointment of the DPO is the qualifications and the experience, which is again shows this is an indication how the regulator is serious about uh, like imposing this uh, law and regulation and which will eventually boost the economy by gaining the trust of the investors to invest within the kingdom. This is the main focus rather than the nationality or any other aspect. And even they have the power of replacing the DPO. The regulator reserves the power to comment on the DPO work or uh, even uh, might ask for its replacement if they are seeing that the, he is not a good fit or not conducting the, the tasks as required. However, on the other side, to be fair with this, there has to be a sort of an empowerment from the organization. And this is also uh, touched upon in the DPO appointment rules, where it talks about how to avoid the conflict of interest, interest when it comes to the DPO role. So one of the things that we have seen as really not a best practice, which that where the DPO is placed or like in the organizations fall under one of the business departments like commercial or enterprise business unit and or even technology. So you can imagine like a DPO whose role is more of an internal supervisory role of the PDPL and who is supposed to be the channel or the spot between the organization and the supervisory authority, the escalation point for any issues. His place or his position is under one of the business departments where he is responsible or accountable for ensuring the compliance and sometimes he may give guidance on certain things that shouldn't be launched, for example, due to violation to the law. So this is one of the things that was requested or like stated clearly as part of the rules to ensure avoidance of conflict of interest and the independency of the role. So the, the DPO will not dis be dismissed or penalized due to conducting or uh, doing his own tasks as uh, stated uh, by the, the PDPL. So on the other side, as I mentioned, there has to be an empowerment ensuring those kind of uh, aspects and dependency of the role, no conflict of interest, 
And on top of that, most importantly, is allocating the right resources and budget in order to do this. So he will never, the DPO will never be able to implement the, the, the mandates without proper resources and budget allocated for that. One of the things that serving the, the privacy compliance program within the organization is the data governance. Usually we don't put it as a dependency or we don't consider it as a dependency in order to start your PDPL or privacy compliance program. However, the existence of it, which is something common in, in the kingdom, is really beneficial for and it will be considered as a program booster when it comes to the implementation. As part of privacy program, there, is, there will be an overlap and some intersection with cybersecurity. On the other side, data governance, and those are and information security and data protection and so on. So it's really important, and this is really tailored on case by case. This is why we were mentioning at the beginning about how to comprehensively design your privacy program to ensure that it's embedded within your business model and based on the different uh, programs that you may have. So we tailor this uh, to our clients as per the maturity when it comes to data governance. And it needs to be uh, done in a very thought manner to ensure that there is no overlapping, no redundancy, and how to ensure the separation between uh, the data governance and the privacy and the cybersecurity. This is really one of the important things. But it can easily fit because the domains and the focus is different. It's all about how you design the intersection and the overlapping how you ensure avoiding redundancy and how you ensure a joint reporting on common things. So one of the things that we work on, for example, is how, for example, if we talk about the data discovery under data governance, this is one of the fundamentals that we would require and we will benefit from as part of the privacy program. So this is where we can establish a link and a joint effort between the two programs. On the other side, between privacy and cybersecurity. So they report on certain aspects that is integrated for privacy uh, when it comes to, for example, user access management, uh, certain cybersecurity controls. So how to establish the link between the two departments to ensure that there is a visibility from the privacy program over the, uh, the progress of the controls implementation on the cybersecurity side and how, most importantly, how to ensure that there is no redundancy in reporting the issues to the management, because it's very uh, commonly uh, happening that the management, the top management, sometimes get confused. Who's focusing on what? I heard this from the privacy program lead before or from the DPO. The same thing is covered by the cybersecurity. So to draw the lines between these and to ensure a proper and a joint and an efficient reporting to the top management is also very important in order to get the right support and empowerment from the top management. When it comes to application, when we talk about application, the material scope of the, of the law of the PDPL, it applies to all. What kind of limitation are there or relief you may get as part of the size is mainly around, for example, the privacy impact assessment. And when it's triggered, you can look at Article 22 of the law and 25 of the implementing regulations, and it would tell you the certain triggers. And if you are a small business or small organization or a startup, you may be relieved from that requirement based on the restrictions or like the certain scenarios that are stated in the regulation. But in terms of the implementation or the applicability, it applies to all. Any further comment, Osama? Yeah, mainly I would wrap up the, the, the session by the, mainly the, the three advices, if we may summarize them in three main actions. So for all organizations, regardless where they are now, um, what state they are with the compliance, uh, the, the main advices are do not underestimate the requirements, try to understand it comprehensively, seek advice from uh, privacy professionals or vendors as applicable in order to ensure that you understand the requirements. Because we have seen certain uh, misunderstandings, certain examples where there was misunderstanding of the requirements. Seek uh, a comprehensive understanding of the requirements, uh, seek consultation even from the regulator itself. Uh, the second point would be ensure that you are designing a tailored uh, privacy program for your organization to ensure that you are covering or embedding it within your business operating model and uh, you are covering or giving an attention to your um, portfolio of products and services. And finally, uh, make sure that you are communicating openly with the regulator and ensure that there is a transparency, regardless which state you are in. Ensure this kind of transparency, as we mentioned, that this will enhance your relation and will increase your credibility before the regulator and will definitely impact uh, the, the, the way they deal with the violations, if they detected any violations within your organization. Thank you so much, Osama. It was very interesting. Thanks very much for joining Thursday Deep Dive and taking the time out. Uh, I've been talking to Osama Al Masri, Middle East Lead, Data Responsibility and Privacy at Global Technology Services. You've been listening to a recording of Middle East AI News. 
live for Thursday, September 19th, 2024, by Carrington Malin, brought to you by On Demand. Thanks for listening.